welcome to IT Pro TV's live webinar. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we're kicking it off with how you can stay cyber secure. To help us do that, edutainer Daniel Lowry is welcoming special guest Ben Fink to the show. Ben is the CTO and co-founder of On Defend. He is a lead security assessor with experience in pen testing, web application security, vulnerability management, and compliance assessments. Daniel is one of our IT Pro TV edutainers, specializing in cybersecurity topics. He's a red teamer who teaches courses like CompTIA Pentest Plus and CEH V11 for the platform. We want to hear from you, so send in your questions through Zoom, social, or our IT Pro TV on air page. One lucky winner will receive some cool IT Pro TV swag. Now, let's go to Daniel and Ben live in Studio One. Hey there, everybody. Greetings and welcome to today's cybersecurity webinar, which is aptly named Be Cyber Secure. We're going to talk about ways in which we can make ourselves and our businesses or our homes or wherever we like a bit more secure when it comes to the old cyber, because as we know, it can be a bit of a dumpster fire out there, and we need to do everything we possibly can to help stave off these attacks that we withstand on a daily basis. So, joining me today will be a one and only Mr. Ben Fink. I'm so glad to have him finally in the studio. Ben. Thank you. Man, it's, it's been a long time coming, but it's in the real life now. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Very nice. I'm looking forward to identifying all of these dumpster fires with you today. <laughs> be a good time. It will be a good time, mm -hmm. by all. So, thank you for everybody for joining. We will definitely be taking questions from you out there in the chat room. So, if you have a question, make sure you drop that in your chats, and they'll field them and send them to us and we'll see what we can do about answering some of that. But like we say, we got a couple of them already ready to go. And uh, we have Trevor is going to be our first question. And he asks, what are some of the best things one can employ at home to provide comprehensive security? There's a lot to unpack in that Ooh, there question, my good that friend. That is a lot. Dare ye, sir. Uh, go after all right. this one. Well, let's, uh, let's dive into this one. Trevor, thanks for the question. So I think I'm going to answer this uh, maybe boring at first, and then we'll get into some more exciting stuff. So the basics, you got to patch everything. So when, it's, when updates are available, it's annoying to reboot your computer, but important to do that. I think the most important thing is knowing that email is the gateway to your digital life, for lack of a better term. If somebody can get into your email, they can get into literally everything else you have access to. Uh, so if you use the same passwords other places, don't tell me about it, but at least don't use it for your email. Uh, and also, if you can, turn on multi-factor authentication so uh, that like you get a text or something from your phone, so you, even if your password gets out there, they don't log in. Oh, and by the way, if your MFA thing on your phone is just going nuts constantly, like, do you want to log in? And you're not trying to log into anything, don't hit yes. Like, it's not you. Don't hit yes. Just hit cancel. Uh, but it's yeah. It's very surprising that that actually works. Like, you're yeah. obviously not yeah. logging into anything. Right. And yet your MFA is going berserk. Yeah. So right? Like, oh, I guess. And, some, and people tend to just give in and go, yeah. whatever. I guess yes yeah. is what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And then that that is not a good way to go. So if no, that starts happening, great, great yeah. advice. Don't do that. Yeah. If it's going nuts, yeah. somebody is trying to get into your account, don't let them. Figure that out. You know, you can some of the good ones, by the way. If you've seen this, show you like the location of where you're trying supposedly right. logging yep. in from, uh, and you presumably know where you are. Yes, I'm not uh, in Philadelphia. Yeah. Today. So if you're not in, you know, Akron, Ohio, which I'm sure <laughs> is lovely this time of year. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, don't don't click yes on that. Right. Uh, a lot of breaches we've heard about lately. Yeah. Had this MFA bombing, they call it, where you're just like. And it's so funny the yeah. that what it kind of exposes is the fact that. We're told, you know, do MFA, right? You got to have yeah. that two-factor turn on it. and turn on. And now that I have it turned on, I'm safe. Yeah. There's always going to be some new angle that people are going to start coming after. Like you say, well, if I can start intercepting those things, and it kind of points out the um, uh, not greatness of using your phone SMS. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is yeah. not the best way to go about doing That's this. That's true. Yeah. Authenticator apps. Much better, right? Yeah. This is way yeah. better way to go. <laughs> That's right. And you, if you start getting those text messages saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to log in, I'm trying to log in, I'm trying to log in, that is a telltale sign that you are being attacked. Yes. And they're just waiting for you to finally get fed up with it. Just turn your phone off. Yeah, yeah just turn it off for a while. That's They'll the get best bored. way to go. They'll go away, they'll do something That's else. It. You don't have to put up with that nonsense no, anymore. No, 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 no. Um, okay, so the other things for the home real quick, I think probably uh, are don't download a lot of free software. Oh, man, take all the fun out of it. Or things you? that are supposed to be <laughs> paying money for that are suddenly free are probably a scam, and mm. you should just skip that. That's how they get you every time, That's right? If it looks time. too good to be true, 
Well, unfortunately, it probably is. That's right. All That's right, right, so there you go. Got good, good advice there. If you start getting hammered with MFA, don't, don't mess with that. And make sure you have it at least turned on because that is a good thing. Use Authenticator apps. And uh, last, keep your email secure as much as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to Michael's question, which is, what are some of the best cybersecurity certificates to work on obtaining in 2022? Ooh. Oh, there's a, definitely a laundry Ooh. list of cybersecurity certs out there. You can get a lot of certs these days. People got to put their money on the barrel head, and they got to know which one is going to be the best one yeah. for them. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so here's the deal. There are certs that get you hired. And there are certs that help you do your job better. I think if I had to talk about the certs that get you hired, unfortunately, the CISSP, while not being necessarily the best from a technical perspective, is still the one that the HR folks know about. So if you're interested in getting past the filter of the HR firewall, uh, the CISSP is the way to go. Uh, beyond that, though, I think depending on your interests, if you are looking to do a lot of offensive security work, uh, there's a lot of really great, actually, offensive, like uh, there's the, the red team, certified red team operator, the CRTO. There's the OSCP, which is still great. They constantly are retooling the offensive security team works over there. What other offensive search, offensive security certs do you Let's like? Let's see, there's PNPT from That's TCM true. Security. Yeah. New cert, great That's a good cert. One. Yep. Very practical, hands-on kind of thing going on there, mm -hmm. as well as and a lot of stuff from eLearn Security, yep. right? They yep. have a, a bevy of really good hands-on mm -hmm. offensive of type security uh, certifications. So again, if you're going that red team side of things, all of these that we have said are pretty well known across the board. Of course, you got the CEH and the Pentest Plus of the world sure, as well. All those things, right? right? So if you're just starting out, some of those can be a little bit better yep. for you as you're getting your feet wet into that world and then start kind of moving up the hierarchy and gathering those kind of, think of it as gamification, yeah. start gamifying, okay, this is my level one and there's yeah. level two and you're going to work your way up the ladder to get those like yeah. uh, CRT, uh, uh, yeah, the red team operators. And, and I think if you're not looking for like an offensive security cert, you should probably look at cloud cybersecurity certs, mm. like whatever those are, right? Get it in Amazon, Azure. A lot of them are going to be vendor specific and that's fine. And maybe like some DevOps kind of work, like understand how source code works. If you don't know what npm install means, that's a good thing to go figure out, and you can figure out some <laughs> some, some passwords. You know, some some good certs that would be in there that would that would get that for you. But I think uh, in terms of certs to get, it's really it, there's a there's a lot. Yeah. Holy moly! I mean, you've so got to pull certs. cloud into. I'm so yeah. glad you brought that up because. Yeah. Without cloud understanding, it's great that you have a bunch of security knowledge, yeah. but everything is moving into the cloud, so you have to be able to work in that environment. All of it, yeah. 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 If your current company where you work isn't already going to the cloud, they will be soon. Uh, and if you go to try to change, you know, work for a new company that's doing pretty exciting things you really like, good chance they're mostly cloud. Uh, and so you're going to want to know that. Besides, I think it's just a matter of time until most companies are going to stop, stop building new like data centers co-location. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be cloud stuff. Yeah. It just makes too much sense in terms of the flexibility and the cost. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. First, yeah, cloud, be, yeah. cloud could be huge. Listen, yeah. even if you're not, like, let's say that you're a complete like, security noob, right? Yeah. Start getting cloud certs. Ooh. Start working in cloud. You can probably jump a lot of people. Exactly, you because you cloud, already yeah. have that cloud knowledge sitting in your hand. Yep. Now you double that up. It's a one-two punch. Yep. Coming in with security certs plus cloud certs, people will be knocking your door down mm -hmm. to get you into their organization. So yep. excellent advice from my man, Ben. All right, let's move to Trevor. Let's see what he's got. He says, what are some of the best password manager solutions? Ooh. What do you like, Ben? Well, I guess this is a question about how paranoid are you? <laughs> so if you're not super paranoid and you're just trying to make it convenient, then some of the ones like uh, one password and LastPass are super duper convenient. They can yep. go on all your devices. They do a great job generating passwords. They do a great job remembering for you, filling them in. It's very easy to, to use really strong, secure passwords. But other, some people are not comfortable with the idea that like your passwords technically live someplace else. Now, if you've read any how those solutions work, they do a pretty good job with essentially zero understanding of what your passwords are. They just get this encrypted blob that they hold onto for you. Uh, but if, you, if, that, if you're a person who that doesn't sit quite right with, there's a bunch of other, like KeePass comes to mind where you have your own storage of that. And then you can move that around wherever you want to. They let you do lots of fun things with like passwords and like key files and all kinds of crazy things. Um, and so I think, I think the answer to this question is how paranoid are you? Are you okay letting somebody else hold your encrypted storage blob? Um, and if the answer is to that is no, then you definitely need one where you're going to you're going to give up a lot of convenience for that, but maybe it's worth it. Uh, if you are somebody who you think uh, well if you're paranoid you think this anyways, but if you think your threat model, your personal threat model includes like 
nation states, like foreign countries who are trying to get into yours, now I would definitely not use any of those, <laughs> those stored cloud ones. I would definitely use your own storage and like just, I don't, man, that, that is actually a crazy world as I think about that to like, if you thought that was, yeah, anyways, if you're a, if you're a normal be, human you and lapses and fancy bear Ooh, after you, yeah. you have done something. You have I mean, done something. feel proud. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've made it to the apex <laughs> of, hey, we need to hack this person. I mean, I would switch to pencil and paper and just get all your money in gold. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that's that's what you got to do at that point. I like but that. yeah, that's a good way to go. So my favorite password manager then is convert all your money to gold and use pencil yeah. and paper after this. Time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just a complete luddite <laughs> at this point. It's just no technology. No technology whatsoever at all. That's not how we roll. But yeah. that's not how we roll. That's not yeah. how we roll. We so. gotta have that tech. So, well, I guess uh, I use LastPass. I, I use found, LastPass too. Like, yeah. I like their Authenticator app. Mm -hmm. I like LastPass. I just make sure that I try to be as secure as I can be using that yes. system. Because uh, at the end of the day, most of these systems doesn't matter whether it's KeyPass or LastPass. If you're not using good security around it, yeah. It's really, it's not doing its, its job as well as it could be doing. Yep, yep. So I MFA into LastPass. Yep. And then just about all my accounts, even though the password's stored in LastPass, I still MFA into. So it's one of those things. And it means that I don't have to reuse any passwords. I don't know any of my passwords. LastPass does. Gun to my head. So, so, I'm so, a dead man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the really important thing is, uh, periodically, you have to figure out a way you're going to export and store these passwords so that if something happens to LastPass tomorrow and suddenly you don't have access. Yeah. Uh, you got to get that figured out. Yeah, I did that the hard way one time. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, manually. Oh, no. <laughs> I lost my, I couldn't remember my password to LastPass. Oh. And I was still logged in, so I just started typing them all out into a flat text file. <laughs> yeah, and right. then created a new account. And here we go. Imported them all yeah. in and here deleted everything, crypto yeah. shredded it. Yeah. And was like, I guess that's what happens when you forget your password. <laughs> and when you're planning for, like, if an emergency happens and somebody that you trust needs access to your accounts, LastPass has a great module that you can do where somebody can be a recovery account. I think it's something like, uh, maybe, I don't know if you've tried this or not, but it's something like, they can request access to your account, and if you don't deny it within like 72 hours, they get access. So if you're in a really bad accident or something yeah. worse happens, somebody can get access to your account. So that's oh, a yeah, really valuable that, yes. feature. I haven't yeah. had to use it, thank goodness. Thank goodness, me neither. But right. you should get that set up so that way your, um, friend, your family can yeah, actually. Your family or somebody can, can yeah. go in there and take care of what they need to do. Yeah, yeah. good point. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's life, right? We got to be prepared yeah. for it. Right. The good news is, is that our password managers out there thinking about those thinking things, about this probably because they deal with it on a daily basis. All right, we got another question coming in from YouTube. Uh, you, uh, should you change passwords every ninety days, or wait for it every thirty days? Oh. Eh? What say you, sir? I feel like this is a trick question. The answer <laughs> is you shouldn't change it that often at all because you should use a crazy strong password that you don't even remember uh, because you're using LastPass or something else that's creating right. these passwords for you and you're using MFA, which is the thing. The, pro, the whole idea of 90 days is that if your password got out there and you change your password, there's like this window of time with which that password is good. But do you know the problem with most people's passwords, Daniel? Is they're garbage? Well, they're garbage. <laughs> and, it's like, and it's like winter 22. Yeah. And so, in the 90 days, it will be spring 23. Yeah, and it I can just guess. It is not hard guess. to figure that out, yeah. right? And if I got fancy, maybe I add like an exclamation point at the end. Ooh, also see, that, not hard to guess. That's super secure. If you uh, are watching at home and you have a pass, an exclamation point at the end of your password, it is essentially the same thing as not having an yeah. exclamation point at the end of your password. From somebody who cracks a fair number of passwords yeah. during the week, I will tell you that that the exclamation point at the end is not helpful. Do it someplace else or use a different piece of punctuation So fun at the fact. End. Fun fact. He's going to use some, some <laughs> options on his password crackers to go, hey, you know what? Take these standard passwords That's that right. everybody's kind of using. Add a few yeah. things. You know, some standard yeah. characters. Maybe one through 99999 nine, 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 yeah. and then exclamations, add symbols. That's right. Have some fun with it. And then he lets the uh, password cracker go burr. And he comes back the next day and goes, hey, look, passwords. You know what else is wild about passwords while we're on the subject? What's that? A lot of people curse in their passwords. They do. And obscene. If you look at the rocku.txt file, Ooh. it is nasty. And they say nasty things. I mean, I have to obscure it in report writing, not right. because I'm trying to hide people's passwords, because it's rude. I wouldn't want to show this to somebody. Oh, it's, it, it's I can be honest with you. Even, the, even some of the hacker handles out there are a little, <laughs> yeah, it's a little colorful. <laughs> it's we say, I'm yeah. making a series about stuff where you're looking up. You yeah. know, point of code or, or, or point of, uh, proof of concept code, and I'm like, oh, I, yeah. I can't show that. I can't that's, show this to that anybody. Is not child friendly. Well, that's true. <laughs> so, Burp Suite, which is a really popular software uh, yeah. assessment tool, doesn't do this anymore. Yeah. They, they go all John Smith, but it used to have a lot of data in there that would be like, if you asked it to like go through and like populate forms automatically, it used stuff that like, I don't want to show this in a boardroom. Right. 
it's a little risque. It's a little risque. I mean, it's not really super bad, but it was enough that I like, oh, I don't think I'm going to show this. And yeah. somebody was like, I'm a professional. And I used, anyways, I won't say what it was here because I'm not sure that how bad it is. That is kind of funny. It is, yeah. Because it's, they think that's never going to get seen. Yeah, like somebody right? will change this before they run this. Let's be no, honest. No, let's be nobody honest, changed any of that. At, at our core, we are all children. That's true. All right. We are just <laughs> big kids. <laughs> and we're like, ha, ha. if it made you laugh in middle school, it's you're probably still, still doing it. still makes it. you laugh. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. still good. Yeah, that's true. All right. Well, then we're having way too much fun with these questions. <laughs> Let's move on. Cindy's got us a question. She says, do you think businesses are going are, are, are doing everything they can to stay cyber secure with remote workers? Hmm. I'm going to just throw it out there and go, we've seen some evidence that might <laughs> indicate that that is not the case. So I think my idea, what, what I'm going to say about this is that remote work makes you much more susceptible to social engineering. Hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And I also think when, the, when, so remote work became a lot more popular about two years ago. Yes. Whenever March of 2020. It's like was. an event occurred. Like some weird event like, occurred. All, that all of a sudden, sudden everybody, everybody. Yeah. yeah every, every business turned into a remote weird. first business. Yeah. It was weird. And uh, there was a was. good period of time there. Where every company realized that like their because their security controls relied on you being like on an internal network, and when that laptop suddenly wasn't on that network every day and it was over this other place like your house, that they didn't do such a good job patching it or recording the security data that came from it. I think for the most part that's been fixed. Uh, so most organizations have kind of figured that out. But being remote and being used to, I guess, getting messages over like electronic means. So we're seeing a, a spike in. Uh, phishing via Teams, which is, which is for Microsoft Teams or, or Slack, because uh, now you can do a lot of like outside of the organization communication, which is both functional for you if you're trying to get work done, but also super functional for the attacker because now they have another way that you probably trust even more than email. Um, and because you're in the office less, you just don't see people to be like, did you get the same thing about the corporate training that we're supposed to be doing? And they can be like, no, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Um, and so uh, that I think that part of it has become less secure. I think overall in terms of managing the infrastructure, I think they're probably there. So, some companies do weird stuff where like they'll put your computer on a VPN because they don't do like access everything over the internet. Uh, and then to save bandwidth costs, they'll do what's called split tunneling, which is where the traffic that goes to the company goes through the tunnel and everything else goes direct, which saves you bandwidth, but also means like if you're going to a site that's like a phishing site, that limits the visibility because they're not routing it through for like the proxy service to get, right? And so, so if you're in a situation like that, then hopefully you have something that's like compensating. Otherwise, people are just going to whatever website they want to on their computer and uh, probably, probably not getting like zero days. Like I don't think they would be burned on that, but definitely like rolling into like fake Microsoft Office looking logins and like typing passwords in, right? So It's kind of funny. Based off of like conversations that we've had and our yeah. experiences and everything, it it seems like, and maybe, I, I, maybe I'm wrong on this, I don't know, you know, but <laughs> you, you tell me if I'm off base. It seems like organizations and even individuals a lot of times do just enough to say we're doing something. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very specific to their environment. It's not necessarily going to be like, well, what if this happened or what if that happened and these one-offs? We don't secure very, very, we don't go hard in the weeds, right, yes. deep in the ink yes. over those kind of edge cases. We do on that standard business case, but not on those edge cases. And that's typically where we get attacks because the security yep. is weaker there. It is. And I will say this, that the vast majority that we see of, like, testing of whether a security tool or thing is installed correctly is if it doesn't break production, mm. which is not at all the same thing as whether <laughs> it works to prevent an attack, right? Uh, so we spend a lot of time working with customers on that, like, what are you worried about with this? Let's make that thing happen safely, yeah. and then let's see how your tools handle it. Um, because until you do that, you're, frankly, you have no idea if you're going to be able to stop whatever the worry is, right? right. And so as these things come up, uh, as these groups come up and do this like MFA bomb, people are like, could we, could we test that? Like, would that work with us? Uh, and the answer is probably yes, and yeah. let's, yeah. Let's, let's, let's give it a try. I love that. The answer is probably yes. Probably yes. Um, I know see. that's not good to hear for you, but it is the truth of the matter, so let's get to fixing this problem. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Let's see here. Um, anything else that we would want to cover that? No? Okay. Well, we're going to move on to Lamar because he's got us a, a question that says, what are some ways we can encrypt our personal devices? That's mm. a really good question. That is a good because question. Because it's something that most people don't do. Mm -hmm. Encryption's just out there waiting for you to use it. 
but maybe you don't know how to use it. Maybe you don't know what would be a good way or what a good encryption would be to use. Yeah. What's, what can we do when it comes to encryption? So that's a great question. So most devices, if it's Windows, it comes with BitLocker. If it's Mac OS, I think they still call it File Vault. Um, if you have an Android phone, you can turn that on. I think a lot of them that comes in, encrypted by default, although Android, you, can, you have to specifically go in if you use the external storage, like that micro MMMC mm -hmm. slot. You have to tell it, I want this to be encrypted. Uh, most of the vulnerabilities that when, when uh, I was spending a lot of time at least looking, looking at Android stuff, <clears throat> came in problems like with the way that it, hand, it handles shared storage, so that becomes shared storage. So like an app can't go into another app space on main, the main device, but if anything gets written to the, to the disk, that external storage is sort of fair game. Uh, so uh, anyways, I would just make sure you turn all that stuff on so if your phone gets lost, they can't unplug that card, plug it into a reader and have access to like unencrypted files. Um, iPhone you know, comes with its own encryption, which I think is turned on by default and I'm not even sure. Most of these are so good with like the hardware um, uh, acceleration they have in there, you don't really notice anymore. So I can't think of a good reason to turn it off. Um, and uh, there are, beyond that, you can do other solutions that will do like encryption of either individual files or you can create a whole volume that you put files in, you interact with, and then when you're done, you close it and nothing can touch it until you basically unlock it again. Um, and uh, what was, what's their name? There was a really popular open source tool that like a few years ago, there was some concern they did like some, some really good audits on. I'm totally blanking on the name now. I will think about it. Uh, but, <laughs> it'll come uh, to you, sir. It'll come to me. <laughs> but you can, you can encrypt whole volumes. You can do what's called, uh, the, whole, the whole volume could be encrypted. And uh, I think for personal use, the stuff that comes with the operating, the operating system is good enough, right? Again, getting back to how paranoid are you? If you're super duper paranoid, then yeah, by, by all means, pick a thing that's not Microsoft's. But unless you're being pursued by nation, if, you, if all you're worried about is like you leave your laptop in a cab, BitLocker will be fine to prevent anybody else from, uh, from getting into that that you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, BitLocker's great. Um, then yeah. there's the full drive encryption for uh, Linux. Uh, Lux, I think it is, right? Is it Lux? Yeah. Uh, I think they do. So if you, you're on Linux, then you probably already know some of these things yeah. anyways. Is it a good chance? Um, Let's hope so. And I would, <laughs> I would definitely do the thing where you would, at the very least, have your home directory like in a different right. partition and totally turn on encryption for well, that. Well, that's thing. just smart anyway because yeah, that way that's true. you can blow away the operating system. And keep all your stuff. And all your yeah. stuff is all still sitting stays. there yeah. just waiting for you. <laughs> so that's just, that's just smart yeah. computering that's out right. there. Right? That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of continuing on uh, that, the security bend, we got Trevor asking, do you recommend using FIDO tokens? Ooh, that's a good question, Trevor. That is a good question. I do recommend using those if you have um, the means <laughs> yeah yeah if you have i mean they do cost a little bit of money uh and if you forget it at home one day you're not going to log into anything <laughs> nope but one of the things we have seen is that that reduces phishing a lot right because the, 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 if you go to log into whatever the site is and you're using your token and there's a bunch of different vendors that implement fido tokens um so it kind of depends on, on your preference there and like what your operating system uh, supports but the beauty of that is the way that the login works. It's like a bunch of, you know, sort of encrypted stuff that goes back and forth with, with the site. And if, if a scammer sets up a phishing site and it's a different domain, like they're not getting the real credentials. So you really can, can, can crank down on that. Um, I think FIDO token would be, if we have a customer that comes to us and they're really worried about it, and even this, they're worried about like the, the MFA bombing, FIDO is, is the solution that fixes that problem. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of hard to fake all that stuff and you have it on you normally, unless you forget it at home, which does happen. Does happen, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you just can go back to the house at that point because yeah. <laughs> you are effectively done working. You can't log it in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're not logging so in. So you today. can make yeah. a little trip back yeah. the other yeah, way. Go figure that out. Yeah. Get your FIDO token, but yeah, they are great. And it just goes to show you if it makes, you know, I always say that security tends to be this like, the scale, right? Mm -hmm. If you have ease of use on one side and security on the other, if you add ease of use, you typically are like losing some security. Big but as time. you can see with FIDO tokens, it can be super inconvenient if you forget that that token. Yeah. <laughs> right? But it is wicked secure. Way, right? way secure, yeah. So like you said, if you're super paranoid, it's definitely the way That's to a fly. good way to think about it, right? Because if it's, I mean, if you can use a computer, then anybody can use it, right? Even right. if it's an attacker trying to pretend to be you. Uh, so if it's a little more inconvenient for you, it's really inconvenient for somebody coming from some other country, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's probably why Apple has done so well, right? Because they've kind of bridged that gap between, it's that's really easy point. for like grandma to use her phone and do FaceTime and all the stuff yeah. that you like about it, but it also has a lot of really good security built into it. And that's sure. why it's a, a very um, targeted system because yep. they're very secure and a lot of people use it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why we say, what's the group over in Israel that does that? Uh, the Pegasus, yeah, right. Yeah. They have that Pegasus software. I mean, they make mad money 
targeting iPhones for Selling some spyware. shady people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can like watch what people are doing, they say, read their texts. We're making and stuff. the world safer. Oh man, yeah. If you say so. Whatever helps you sleep at night. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Hector. He's got a question for us. Let's see here. What are the most practical slash realistic software for cell phones to fend off unwanted calls or scammers? Oh. Uh, the That's, off button. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was gonna say I don't know. But if you find out, Hector, I would love to know the answer to that question. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't even think there was software. So, there. I mean, you get those um, robocall. Like yeah. this is a robocall. Yeah. Right. Some some like built-in. I have an Android phone. It will tell me it thinks this is robocall or spam. So the question is: Is that does the carrier do that, or does your phone do that? I believe there is an app on my phone that does that. It is a really? Verizon app that does that. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm over here telling everybody I'm running Android on Verizon. <laughs> So, so I have an iPhone on T-Mobile as one of my devices, and yeah. that one gets the scam likely. Okay, shows up, and I think it's T-Mobile that does that. You think it's T-Mobile? Because I don't, I didn't install an app that I'm aware of. Maybe I have the Pegasus gotcha. on there. Yeah. Maybe they're putting <laughs> that in the background Pegasus. for me. <laughs> they're Maybe they're loading that up man. in the background. They're coming to get you. <laughs> is it NGO Group? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, sounds. that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy man. Well, I'll that, tell you what. Mad crazy hackers over in Israel. Yeah. Like that whole place. They know how to build a hacker over there. So, so not to get us too far off topic. Yeah, yeah. But they have. Well, this will get us way far off topic. But they do this thing over there, that's really cool, where it's like a melding of like government and like military with like academia and with like startup culture, where there's like all they're constantly all these yeah. companies getting. So you have a lot of people who are like, um, uh, I think Unit Eighty Two Hundred is yeah, what it's called. Yeah, Eighty Two Hundred. Yep. And so like all these people with great operational experience of like nation state level tradecraft who suddenly have an idea of like. I know a thing we should probably do to stop yeah, malware. We'll call it Palo Alto. Yeah. Right? That's legit. Yeah. That guys came from 8200. Yeah. 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 So, I Constantly. Just, a lot of them. Yeah. A lot of really great tech. Um, yeah, man. We have some partners that, that are based in Israel uh, and super sharp people. No man, doubt. No, no doubt, doubt about it. Like you say, they, they're they training them up when they're yeah. young. Yeah. Like real early. But they got some top-notch hackers up there working some neat stuff. All right. Enough of that rabbit trail. Let's move back to questions <laughs> from the audience here. Chris has one for us. says, how can you protect yourself when traveling to other countries? Ooh. That's a great question. That is a super good question. Um, that, how Faraday cage around your body? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. right. Just wrap yourself yeah. in, uh, in, a, suit. in a sheath. Yeah, yeah of, of that's metal. a copper suit you're wearing. So, <laughs> so uh, okay. So uh, here's my blanket advice: if you're traveling to another a foreign country, um, is if you're going to bring a computer, consider the country you're traveling to and what they may ask you to do at the border. I guess. Um, and if you are just going for pleasure and you don't need like your work computer, then don't bring your work computer, mm. right? Super simple. Um, I would say when you're traveling, your devices for the most part are secured. Like you don't leave them like unlocked without you know you looking to see if they're trying to like load something on there. Uh, if you think you're going to a country where that happens, then I wouldn't bring any of your stuff. I think we'd go back to the pencil and paper idea. Uh, but if you if you travel there, the only thing you really have to worry about is how secure is the network you're connecting to. So I would maybe set up your own VPN before you leave, so that your devices like your phone and your laptop and tablet just always connect through. Always VPN. connect to it. Um, if you if that's something you don't want to do or there's a technical reason why you can't do that, then I would make sure you use something like the Signal app to communicate. Uh, that way, a Signal does a really great job of of providing true end to end encryption that not even the Signal folks can read. Um, and so that gives you some level of confidence that, that there's nobody monitoring this communication as you go back and forth. Um, I don't know how practical it is to travel without like a smart device, right? Um, so when I've traveled recently for work, I've definitely had to take a phone. Now I bring a, not my primary one, I bring a secondary one that doesn't have all of my MFA codes on it, for example, um, but enough that I know what I'm gonna be doing for while I'm working and allows me to keep in contact with people. Um, man, that's such a great question. So you're you know, definitely like a proponent of burner phones Using yeah, those for travel. I think so. I mean, that way, it's for They're a lot cheap, of reasons. Right? They're cheap, and if you lose it, who cares? Yeah, you throw it in the Thames River. And that's all. Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, if you go to, if you're go over to Walmart there, and get another one. If you're over there and they Do really want to have Walmart access to a thing, like, okay. I mean, I guess, you know, it's, 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 uh, maybe that's a little cavalier of me to say because I'm not traveling to any place that has like a repressive regime. True. And I'm not a targeted individual. But but if I were, that's I would probably even go more that direction, right? Like really hardcore. That yeah, kind of I've thing. seen a lot of like, um, like dumb phones becoming popular yeah, lately. Sure. Where you're just getting like, an old Nokia that does yeah. uh, text and talk yeah. and maybe GPS or something or sure. take a photo or something with it. Yeah. Just yeah. simple devices, like you say, that if I lost it, no big deal. No big deal. Doesn't have any like real hooks into my life mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. than you know a few phone uh, yeah. numbers probably pre-programmed in it so I can yeah. 
know who's calling me. But without being like crazy paranoid, I would say as long as you have a good VPN connection, then you can kind of get, the whole thing is like, how trusted is the network? Are people monitoring me? Yeah. Are people trying to mess with the traffic? And if you're over a VPN where everything goes through that tunnel, it doesn't matter anymore. Because it's all going back to your home location and then coming out from there. You ever use one of those little travel routers? I have. Those yeah, are cool. Those are great. Yeah, right? those are yeah. really great. Yeah. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about configuring the device. The other thing I'll say is that, uh, though, well, this is those 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 VPNs are very good for getting around like country blocks. So you're like uh, in whatever country and you want to watch something on Netflix. Like we're sorry, we don't have that option in your country. Like you do now. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, silly, silly yeah. Netflix. <laughs> Of course we do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Do like that. So, yeah. cool stuff. A lot of great stuff you can do when traveling. Yes. Uh, all great options that Ben has given us today. All right. Let's get another question. This one's from Aiden. Is coding an important skill for cybersecurity? I'm sure you've never heard this question before. Uh, <laughs> we coding, say that facetiously. Coding is a critical skill for cybersecurity. I'm going to just say thank you for answering that. that I way. don't, yeah, you're welcome. I, I don't know that you have to become a developer, but you have to know how to code. And not even so much like writing full on like programs and like creating binary files and stuff, but you have to know how to script up some of what you're doing. Um, if you go to do cloud stuff, cloud is infrastructure as code. So like by definition, you are coding to build this thing up. Um, my, can I soapbox this for a minute? Please, sir. All right, so yeah. my uh, my standard and standing <laughs> advice for anybody who wants to get into cybersecurity preach is the <laughs> is like the fundamental stuff you have to have in place is I recommend three things. First thing is you have to know how to use a Linux operating system, not because Linux is better, because Linux will force you to use the command line. Things are going to go wrong. And you're going to have to get used to reading error messages and log files, which is a critical skill for anything you're gonna do in cybersecurity. The second thing I usually tell folks is learn a programming language. Uh, again, you don't have to become a developer, but you have to know how to program. My standing advice used to be Python, uh, because you can both do it interactively, and then you can create like s programs out of it. Uh, but PowerShell is super great. And, if, and now my advice is if you're on a Mac, use Python. If you're on a Windows machine, use PowerShell. Same exact thing, you can do it interactively, you can create tools out of it. Uh, it gets you access to like all of the great .NET stuff that's part of Windows and you can see a lot of things. And once you've gotten one of those down, you can generally know enough to like look at another programming language and be like, oh, this is a function, this is what I call, I get how it works now. The third thing that, that I think uh, is really critical <clears throat> is that you have to know how to take and read a packet capture. That, in f that means that you have to know how networking works, you have to understand like what works at layer three, how IP routing works, you have to understand where all these other packets, like what this means when this comes in, because the answer, if something is broken on the network, like of two computers talking to each other, is good chances in the packet capture if you don't see it in one of those log files. So uh, because it forces you to know how networks work, that is a huge deal. Um, and I think if you have those three things, then you can pretty much go in any direction you want inside of cybersecurity, uh, but that'll give you the foundation you need. So coding is critical. Listen, Ben, you're, you're sounding like you're putting a lot of work on my plate here, man. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, you ever see that meme where someone's like uh, stepping like six steps above yeah. and they obviously <laughs> can't step up, yeah. but yeah. each step says something like operating systems, networking, yeah. programming, yeah, yeah. You're just like uh, and it's cybersecurity. Breaking into somebody's yeah. Facebook account. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. No. You, you can't That's step over those things. Yeah. There's, yeah. No, what, uh, I see, there's no shortcut to the finish line. It's true. You, you got to learn those things. And I always tell people, like, if you're starting out in IT, that's perfect. Go ahead and start yeah. learning programming yeah. now. Because yeah. if you want to get into cybersecurity, if you ever think that's going to be something that interests you, you've already got that done, right? And it's, i got to be honest with you, I was that guy. I was the guy that said, I don't want to learn programming. I've already got a lot to learn. Yeah. I don't need another big, hefty lift, right, to put on my plate. Plus, I'm not a, I'm not a programming not a person. programmer. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer. Right? Yeah. But once I started realizing what I could do with it and oh. started automating things and, like, I started understanding things more, imagine if I'd have done that 15, 20 years ago totally. when I started out. I'd have been in a way better shape than I am today. Yep. So if you're starting out or if you haven't started yet, just get to it. Yeah. And start learning some sort of code. That's off the soapbox then? Soapbox is done. done. Put it away. Yes. Now, if you'll be ready. We got another question. This one comes from Scott, who asks us about the Chrome browser and whether or not it is a good password manager. Uh, I wouldn't know, because I don't use Chrome, honestly. So I use Chrome. I don't let it store my passwords, uh, but that's more just because I, I, I know I have a place yeah. to store the passwords. I think 
I think, uh, well, I'll put it this way. A lot of the, like, the fake malware we write includes, like, how to dump passwords from Chrome. So I guess I'll <laughs> say no. <laughs> I guess I'll say no. Uh, don't, there's don't, your answer, Don't Scott. store your passwords in Chrome. <laughs> well, bro browser, like, I mean, it's probably fine. I mean, it's, I mean, it's sync, Sue. So you have, if you have, like, a password, right. presumably they, I mean, I know they encrypt it, but there's ways to get access to it. Well, plus, um, if it, let's say if I had some sort of access to your actual device oh yeah and I, I open chrome you're logged in yeah right yeah. whereas like you said i log out of LastPass. yeah and multi-factor into it every time i need it yeah yes it is convoluted it's annoying. Yeah. and it's going around my elbow to get to my backside yeah but it keeps me a whole lot more secure than if yeah. i just leave everything logged in and yeah. most people tend to just log in and stay logged in and if you get your device compromised in some way now they have all your passwords via your browser manager right I think it's probably like you forgot your toothbrush and you're at the hotel and they give you like the free one at the yeah. front desk and it's like technically this is a toothbrush. <laughs> yeah. But this is not a toothbrush I would like to use no. more than one time. No, and you have to do like one yeah. tooth at a time with that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super slow, <laughs> doesn't really get in there very well. I mean it's technically a toothbrush, uh, but there are better toothbrushes. Yeah, I've but use a better toothbrush. Always heard about, you know, browsers have for a long time been trying to store passwords yeah. for us and they have constantly been a target of attack because they know Hey, as hackers, we know where you're storing your passwords. That's right. I'm going to go for that low-hanging fruit. I'm going to go get that, yeah. Right out of the gate. <laughs> and probably going to get a win out of it, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least something, right? How often do you guys do that? Uh, we do that all the time. I mean, yeah. we do that on like when we're on like engagements where we're breaking into folks' machines because a lot of stuff gets you know saved and people reuse passwords. Yeah. So that's do. helpful. So even if it's not the password we're looking for, it probably gives us a clue about the password that's we do true. want. That's true. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, I think the thing is because Chrome is so ubiquitous, the like building, spending the time to build the utility to dump the passwords from Chrome, yeah, is super worthwhile. Oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah. So then it happens, yeah. Hey, it's that yeah. programming thing we were just talking about, right? Where you build something that does That's something for you and starts That's the automating thing. Yeah. your life <laughs> instead of thing. doing everything the hard way. Yeah. yeah, why do we do that? Why I don't do we know. bang our heads against the wall? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, there you go, Scott. Now you know that I would not be using the use use a purposefully built password manager. Yeah, do that. They have that's what they focus on. That's their that's their skin in the game, as it were. Use that. That's the right tool for the right job. All right, let's see what we got from the question bank. Alvin writes in. He asks, career changer into cybersecurity here. Ooh. I have non-tech related higher education degrees. Is a bachelor's degree necessary or are certs enough? Oh, great question, Alvin. Congrats mm. on the career change. That Absolutely. Is welcome probably, to Probably Yes, welcome. <laughs> that is probably daunting to, comp to, like, to ponder, like changing yeah. your career. Uh, here's the deal. Uh, most companies will have a requirement for a bachelor's degree. And again, like the CISSB is a filtering tool. If you actually have like skills and you can network to somebody, there's a good chance they can get a work around that. Uh, I... At our company, we don't have a requirement for any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, because we uh, we're more like into like the work you can do as opposed to the certs or um, uh, the higher education degrees. But if you already have a bachelor's degree, that's probably enough. And I will say that I don't think um, there, there's not a place I bumped into where I know there's like a no doubt. Like if you have this bachelor's degree and it's more like a something. Preference. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and I, like, I've seen where a lot of companies are kind of moving toward that. You know, you th I think about developers a lot, right? And developers, they don't have a ton of certifications. Right? They typically do have a degree, but not always. A not lot of always, them yeah. don't. They just have a portfolio of yes. stuff that they've built. Right. And the cybersecurity world has kind of seen that and started kind of following suit, at least from my experience where they're going, oh, yeah, I mean, if you have a degree, that's great, and we'll take that. But if you don't, there's plenty of other ways for you to prove yeah. your skill set. Do you have a GitHub? Yes. Do you have a good like LinkedIn page that's active? You're always, you know, connecting with people and making posts and doing something in the community. Maybe you got a blog or you got like a YouTube channel. Yeah, give it's, a talk at a conference, right, something like right. that. Yeah, so there's do a, that. lots of cool ways to like prove yourself as a cybersecurity yeah, person. You, you, I would say that you do not have to go back and get another bachelor's degree. Now maybe that ends up being the path you take, uh, but I would say that probably certs are enough and maybe depending on what you do, uh, follow Daniel's advice. This is a career field unlike any other that is about doing. Um, and one of the things that's weird about this career field is it's so, uh, like, I guess, like, unmanaged is the good way to say it. Like, for example, like, if you're going to become a lawyer, there's a very defined process. Yeah. You can't just hang yeah. a shingle out. Yeah, you, know, you can't be like, hey, I think I'm good at this law stuff, and suddenly, you know, I take clients on. But you can for security. You could decide today, I think I'm a cybersecurity consultant, and nobody's going to stop you. Nope. Now, maybe nobody will pay you. <laughs> 
but nobody's going to stop you, right? So that's yeah. kind of the thing, man. You get to find out your own path. So like, and in, unlike most career fields, this is about doing. So go hit up some of these things. Try. I mean, that's that's the way. Learn how to do what you're interested in, and then find people who need that skill set. Right. And, and it's a whole lot cheaper than yeah. going and getting that degree. Ooh. Just saying. Yeah. Right. We've all seen that. Yeah. Degrees are expensive. Yeah. Not that they don't have their place, but as Ben was alluding to, if you do a bunch of stuff and you can prove you've done a bunch of stuff, you. No one's going to stop you yeah. from putting yeah. your shingle out and going, hey, I'm a cybersecurity expert. Cybersecurity expert. Put me in a game, coach. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm ready to go. Now, so, yeah. is there any kind of legal caveats when it comes to, like, let's say I did say I was a cybersecurity expert and I wasn't the greatest in the world and I, I uh, you know, told my client, do X, Y, and Z. They did it. Things went boom, boom. Could they come after me illegally? Would I still have to, like, work on legal Yeah, yeah, that's stuff, a great question. Right? So that wouldn't be, like, a criminal thing. That would totally be a civil thing. Yeah, it'd be a civil thing. So you definitely want, oh, yeah, this is good advice. If you are thinking of starting your own cybersecurity firm, think really hard about it. <laughs> and then decide to get a good lawyer Yeah. and good insurance. You're going to need both. And when you write that contract, make sure you're very clear, like, stuff that we do in the process of trying to recreate an attack that might cause a problem for your system is part of the game. That's like, I'm, it's not my fault. Yeah, you accept a certain amount of risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we get all the time questions from customers being like, we want you to do the pen test, and then we want your insurance to cover it if we ever get hacked. I'm like, oh, that is not how that's, this yeah, works. This, uh, I don't think you read the rules that's here. Right. <laughs> that's right. That is not how this works. Yeah, because uh, I have definitely seen where yeah. companies come in, they do a pen test, and then like six months later, they get compromised, yeah. and they go, well, we had a pen test, yeah. and you said we were secure. It's like, ah, you did not read that legalese <laughs> we threw right. in front of you. you saw signed on because it says that this is our best effort with the amount of time we have yeah with and the scope you're giving right. us with all this other stuff like right there's only so much we can do and the time we have in here and the stuff that you'll show us plus who knows what changed between what time we tested and right. when the thing happened right and if somebody gives up their password and then clicks yes on the mfa login like i kind of can't pen test for that for you yeah you know, that's kind of it so buyer beware mm. when it comes to doing that. So now you know, hopefully as well. All right, we got a question from Greg who asks about a new port scanner that he's seen advertised oh. called Rust Scan. Have you heard of this port scanner and is it safe? Uh, great question, Greg. Uh, so uh, I think I am familiar with this one. So I, I'm gonna go on just a little bit of faith here that Rust Scan is a network scanner built in Rust, uh, which is a programming language very similar to Go. But I think made by Mozilla, whereas Go is made by Google. Go is Google, yes. So that's like the vanity thing now is you have your own programming language, right? Like if you are a big tech company, yes. unless you've got your own programming language, what are we even doing here, right? So, uh, so Rust is awesome. Uh, I dabble in Rust. Most of the stuff that we write is uh, either C Sharp, Golang, or uh, still a bunch of Python and PowerShell. Uh, Rust is awesome, as I've said. <laughs> Port scanners are also awesome. They I do. believe the idea behind Rust Scan is that it's so Rust is like super high performance when you build it and comp it basically compiles to binary, and then it's super duper high performance. So this is like a scan the internet like from in an afternoon kind of a thing. It, it's meant to be kind of an end map replacement, yeah, right? Yeah. And so it's taking the old end map idea, kind of looking a lot like it even, yes. but. Running Rust under the Rust. hood, yeah. so it's super fast. Well, super fast, that's yeah. right. Faster than, uh, Python, uh, and that is written in C? I, I thought was, it was It used to be Lua. Is it all? Well, I know some of the extensions are Lua. Is the whole yeah, thing Lua? Lua? I, I, won't, I don't know. Ooh, if it's really, man. It might be in C, like, for the main. Like the core modules and everything else. Yeah, those are Lua. definitely written yeah. in Lua. I don't remember. I, I think the answer is if you're compiling it yourself and you want to comb through the it is open source, source code. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's open source as far so as I know. Then the answer is yes. That's the great thing about open source, right? Is you can't really hide a lot from it. That's me. in there. It's in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, if you are not doing that, if you're downloading Rust scan compiled by somebody <laughs> else, probably not. Yeah, buyer beware. Uh, uh, the Coffee other thing I will say, <laughs> if you are planning on scanning the internet, uh, there are uh, some places that don't take kindly to being scanned. And uh, so maybe don't do it from your house IP address. That's what we get Shodan for, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Show, I mean, the, the folks at Shodan and Census and other places, yeah. they do spend a lot of time scanning the Internet for you. Uh, but if you're going to do it, I would say you probably want a high performance, you know, like a 10 gig link in a data center someplace with your own own Linux server, like running on the bare metal hardware. But yeah, sure. I mean, if you compile it, play with it. I mean, that is where you learn how this stuff works, right? One of the beauties of open source, as Daniel mentions, you, you can see the source code and make modifications to it. So if you want to change the way a thing works, 
it's one of the great parts of, of open source software. And then you can choose whether or not you want to contribute that back to the community. So if you write a, a cool flag that like checks for the presence of a vulnerable web server, that might be super useful for you. And if it's useful to you, there's a good chance it's useful for other folks. Make a pull request and send it back in and see if the authors of that project want to include it. But uh, yeah, I think if you are compiling it yourself and you're using it like in a controlled manner where you're authorized to do the thing, the answer is probably yes. If you're downloading something that somebody's selling Rust scan, and you have no idea like where they made this thing and they want you to run it on your computer, I would be highly suspicious. Yeah, and it's yeah. cool that it's 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 in GitHub, right? So oh, yeah. Yeah. go to GitHub, you're gonna see the community and the people that are supporting it, and you can kind of read through the issues, mm -hmm. other people it's so it's not it's not gonna be this hidden thing yeah. that's but if you are downloading some from somewhere that has a pre-compiled that's when you need to get yeah. super like, mm, mm. always go to the source, right? Yeah. Never trust anything other than the known place. But other than that, I've run Rustcan. It works really well. It's super duper fast, like uh, Ben says. So I, I would say go to GitHub yeah. and get it from there. Yeah, get it from the it. real place. That's yeah, right. Get yeah. it from the yeah. real place. All right, we have another question in for us. I'm going to do my best at this name, Gian Luis. That's pretty Gian good. Luis, okay, uh, asks, what measures do you take when attending hackathons and or events like Black Hat? I actually just went to Black Hat. Yeah. A lot of fun, mm -hmm. but everybody's like, got your phone turned off, right, bro? <laughs> right? You got, can't break your phone. You got That's right. That phone, they're going to get you on that phone. That's right. And it has happened in the past. Do you go to these events? And if you do, what's your uh, Yeah, great advice? question. I, I do attend a few events like this. Uh, I would say that, that when you're talking about that particular uh, time in Las Vegas that Black Hat is probably not your biggest concern. Black Hat's pretty commercial, uh, but DEF CON, definitely there are folks who feel less inhibited about doing things that may or may not be illegal. Uh, and so those, those are ones where maybe you follow some similar advice that uh, we talked about like when you're traveling to a foreign country. Like I, I, don't, I wouldn't go necessarily nuts like you have to have a burner phone. Again, like how big of a target are you really? But I would probably turn off the Wi-Fi and I would probably turn off the Bluetooth and just use your cellular connectivity to do network stuff while you're there. Now that's not to say that there's not crazy stuff happening on the uh, you know, yeah, cell, cell hackers. Oh, yeah. yeah, people and people are always trying to do stuff up there. So things happen weird. So if you feel really strange about it, just turn it into airplane mode, take pictures, and then you know, run back outside the, of the casino. Yep. And, uh, you know, everybody always talks about like wanting to not plug into uh, like USB ports when you're on, in Vegas when you're doing that stuff, and that's probably good advice all over, right? Like, don't don't plug your phone directly into a USB port you don't control now. Do I think that there's a lot of those around? Probably not, right? I think that's vanishingly rare, but you also don't want to be the person to find that out. Yeah. I think the other, the other thing that I would say is that same advice about the VPNs applies there too, right? So if you're worried about like, I wonder how good this stuff is encrypted over the wire when my cellular provider takes it, just turn on the VPN and now you don't even worry about it. It's like encrypted inside of encrypted or not, right? But you know at least your encryption. Yeah, fun fact, don't stay at the Luxor because this was fun. Everybody here was like, hey, I'm trying to connect to the Wi-Fi, and the Luxor Wi-Fi would you know, take you to a captive portal, oh, right? No. But check this out. Oh, if no. you had the firewall turned on or VPN or anything, that stuff did not work, right? So you had to turn off all your security <laughs> uh, to connect to the Luxor's <laughs> Wi-Fi. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and I, I called the front desk and I said, you understand you guys are hosting an event, because it's all part of the MGM, yeah, yeah, like right. they're an MGM uh, uh, hotel. I said, you guys are hosting an event, one of the largest hacker events in the world. You got so many hackers here right now that this is probably bad. She goes, I didn't do it. I go, I understand. Yeah. You're not the tech person that set yeah. this up. I get it. Yeah. But you may want to run that up the chain. <laughs> Just let yeah. them know yeah. that having no internet access, and I had no, I couldn't get, it was like a Faraday cage. I had no cell signal in my room. Yeah. I had nothing. I had to go yeah. outside, Ooh. away from the hotel to get any kind of, of yeah. network. It, yeah, and I, you know, I think the other thing is like, even if you did like at that particular thing, even if somebody did get in the middle of your communications, it's probably just to like prove they could do it. Right. I doubt like you, they're really going to steal your identity. People are more just there to have fun and show off that they figured right. this thing out. Yeah, that's it's what like, they have. Like the you say, if you go to DEF CON, yeah. they got the wall of sheep. Yeah, right? exactly, the wall of sheep. Yeah, yeah exactly, that they yeah. do there, and that's kind of funny. But if you're a black hat, like so all commercial. I do, keep, keep all your radios off. Like yeah. I even kept my Wi-Fi. I'm not my Wi-Fi. My cell off. Yeah. Just and put then it when on I was ready to look something up, do your thing. Yeah. turn it on. Turn it on. Do your do thing. thing. Turn it back turn off. Turn it back off. Yeah. Not a big deal. S super simple. Yeah. So keep a battery around that way you don't have to plug in anything. Yep. They're like ten bucks at your local super, dollar yeah. store gas super station. Good. Yeah. They're sitting right there. Five thousand miles, right? Totally. Yeah. Keep you keep you squared away. So that's what I do. Yeah, great stuff there. All right. Let's look at Raul's question. Who asks? 
what's the best way to start a GRC career? Mm. Go, in, go in governance and compliance. Yeah, yeah, GRC. Well, uh, I guess the good news on the GRC side is that a lot of money gets spent in security specifically to make sure that we are maintaining compliance, so that becomes a big thing. Uh, you know, that, that's a really great question, Raul. I, mean, I think for, if you're gonna do this, you definitely come at it um, from any, any angle you want, but you, you're gonna have to start by learning what some of these compliance frameworks are. So the most common by far is the NIST 853. It's the, it's the much bigger and more complex version of the NIST cybersecurity framework and uh, some other things. So once you start figuring what those things are, you can start seeing where those things are getting applied to, those that get tagged all the time and all mm -hmm. kinds of security controls. Uh, they're frequently hiring uh, analysts uh, in roles, like entry level roles that need to do GRC things. A lot, a lot of the times though, these aren't necessarily in the security team, they're like internal audit. Uh, and so you wanna look in that area instead. So it's not audit of dollars, it's audit of like IT infrastructure. And uh, this is true both of like in-house companies and like there's a ton of third party consulting firms that have this, where like you're gonna go work with them to do um, well, any number of compliance things, whether it's an ISO 27001 compliance or uh, a SOC 2, or there's so many crazy numbers and letters uh, that, that go in there. Uh, but if, if you go there, a lot of them need the ability to have people that can go work with customers to collect a lot of data. And so there's loads of uh, entry level jobs for GRC. I think that's actually a pretty good way to get into security. Because then once you see that, you can see other parts of it like, ooh, I really like that. And now you've got a, a path to go. Yeah, that's a great point that you bring up is like, everybody tends to think cybersecurity is ethical hacking. And that's, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's like GRC, SOC analyst one, like yeah. getting into those like, like junior cloud security admin, those are great ways because no yeah. one's thinking that. That's right. Right? So you could start going down the path that uh, is less well taken and you find yourself not so much in the fray of everybody vying for the exact same jobs. And then you just pivot from that career and you take the stuff that you've learned from that and it does apply to the hacking side of things yeah. if that's where you're eventually wanting that's to right. end up. That's right. So it's a great path to go. Uh, it, it's it's just not thought of as much. So good for you, Raul, for coming up with some GRC Absolutely. questions. Absolutely, yeah, make it happen, man. But he's not the only one with a great question. We've got Dale asks, and this is, I read this question while you were talking, it's a really good question. How do you go from a sysadmin to security? Seems like a lot of gatekeeping going on, and even with the sysadmin experience, it seems like the bar is really high yeah. to get into security. Yeah. Good segue there. Dale, you are not wrong. <laughs> no. uh, and I apologize on behalf of other security people for the <sighs> gatekeeping thing. It happens, it's unfortunate. Um, I actually find that folks who come from a sysadmin background do great at security for a bunch of reasons. Number one, you are already very familiar with how a specific segment of a, a very important segment of our company's work. Uh, it also means that you probably see the things that sysadmins do when they're lazy that are <laughs> less secure than you probably want it to be. Uh, and so I think that's actually a really great thing. So uh, if you experience gatekeeping, it's either inside the company you're already in, which is a great sign that you probably should get out of that company, or it's, it's you mean in the first place of like getting into other companies. I think <clears throat> what, I would, what I would do is go back to, um, I think you mentioned this earlier today, is like go to some of these um, conferences, go to some of these events, do some of these things, network it to know other people, and show that you have an interest in security. I mean, you would be amazed. I bet you would be functional in a security team very, very quickly. If your current company isn't like really um, siloed about this and they have, you can find anybody on the security team who's interested, security team people frequently need allies in other divisions of the company. And if you are a sysadmin, let's just say you manage Linux servers, for example. Linux servers are notorious for being like, what is on this thing? How does it work? What data do we get from it that we would even know there's a problem here? If you can give them that information, then you make yourself indispensable. And there's a good chance they will reciprocate by giving you an insight into what they do, bringing you in when some of that stuff happens and then you can think about the lateral moving on to the security team. Very good advice right there because unfortunately, like you say, it's a, there is a bit of gatekeeping going on. There's also uh, looking for trends, mm -hmm. look for where security is, like people aren't going for the same amount of jobs. Like I know everybody wants to become a pen tester, right? Yep. It's cool, it's awesome, it does sound, because it is, just what it is, right? Not everybody wants to be a SOC 1 analyst, but if you start off in that area, yep. you can easily pivot. You've already got that, like Ben was saying, you're already a systems admin. I also like to say wherever you're, I don't care if you're on the help desk, you're at the front desk, 
if you start implanting yourself as how can I help increase the security, I'm really interested in security, you tell the people that you work with on the IT tech or even the, uh, the specific security folks that are there that you're interested in that, all of a sudden you can't shut them up, yeah. right? Yeah. They, they're like, oh yeah, let's come, I'll show you this. They want to show off. Mm -hmm. You start telling them, hey, I'm, I'm trying to learn this stuff, you guys are super cool, and what can I do to help? What can I, I'll, I'll volunteer my time, I'll yep. volunteer my skills, whatever I can do. All of a sudden you start to see them trying to help you. And a lot of times it can boil down to, it's not necessarily what you know, but who you know yep. that True. can help you get that past that gatekeeping. So great way to go. All right, that said, we have some stuff to tell you about when it comes to IT Pro TV. And then we got to give away some swag. So I'm going to pitch it back to Lauren and she's going to inform you with what's up. Level up your IT knowledge with IT Pro TV. You can check out a free IT Pro TV membership, no credit card required, with access to select courses and our daily live feed. You can also get a full personal membership that provides complete access to all the IT Pro TV courses with or without practice exam and virtual labs. If you're on a team, you'll want to check out the business page, which offers a tour of the pro portal used to maximize your team's investment in training. And if you sign up for a personal membership, Daniel is going to give you a 30% off. Just enter promo code WEBINAR30. Daniel, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Lauren, for that. And guess what? We have today's swag winner, which is Jean-Louis. Congratulations, hey, Jean-Louis. We will reach out to you to get your information. Do not put those things in any kind of chat or anything. This is security, right? Good OPSEC. We'll get out to you so that we can make sure to get you that swag, and hopefully you can support that in your next webinar. It'll be a lot of fun. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Ben, uh, I want you to give you this opportunity as well to talk a little bit about on defend because people might be really interested to learn what you guys have to offer. Appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely check us out at ondefend.com. We're also active on uh, Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. Our handle is at ondefend on all those platforms. Uh, we'd love to interact with everybody, so, so drop us a line, let us know what you thought about today. All right, well thanks so much, Ben, for stopping by. I've enjoyed this thoroughly. This is the kind of thing I live for. Hopefully you do as well and that you enjoyed it, but it is time for us to say a fond farewell. And thanks for joining us. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. You will receive a link to the recording of the webinar delivered to your inbox. Remember, the coupon code is WEBINAR30. See you back here for the next IT Pro TV webinar.